This might be the strongest wrap-up to a week that we've ever had on this show. It would be fair to call some of the developments this week, most especially on Tuesday night, unexpected. A resounding win for Alberta's new Democratic Party, uh, securing 54 seats at the Alberta legislature, some of those at the expense of longtime MLAs, many of them wildly popular in their ridings. Two of those MLAs joining us live in studio this morning for an hour-long roundtable chat. Thomas Lukasik, good morning. Morning. Lori Blakeman, good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you both. Is this, Lori, your first interview since Tuesday night? Uh, yes. What's been going through your mind over the last 48, 72 hours? Where are you at right now? Well, happily, I was really sick. <laughs> Um, I had a a cold that came on uh, the day before and managed to stay in bed most of election day, got up, went down to the campaign, found out I'd lost and my world had ended as I knew it, Uh, went home, went back to bed and stayed in bed for a day while I hacked my lungs out. So um, the first bit just went by in a haze of NyQuil and um, and now I'm... I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be positive about it and move on. Thomas, where's your head been at over the last two and a half days or so? Well, you know, after election night, I went home and I literally slept like a baby. I woke up every 15 minutes and I cried. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then uh, the next morning, you know, you it's... You respect the outcome, obviously, but like Laurie indicated, being an MLA, and and if you really are serious about being an MLA, it is not a job. It's not nine to five. It's a lifestyle. It's who you become. Uh, When you're grocery shopping, people approach you and you discuss policy in the lineup. Uh, um, Your kids uh, live that life. Your spouses live that life. And that suddenly just ends. And you ask yourself, who am I? You know, what's my role? And and you, we tend to be activists. There is still a lot of issues to be addressed. Um, and, and now you have to do it from a different platform. But, you know, oddly enough, the hardest part it was going back to the constituency office. And I have a whole bunch of active files where we're help, helping families with issues. And now I have to sort of walk away from them and call them and say, I can't help you anymore. That was tough. Both of you wore your hearts on your sleeves uh, through your tenures at the legislature. Both of you very outspoken, and we'll talk about this in different contexts because we have to. Lori, you were speaking up in opposition. Thomas, you were oftentimes speaking up against Mm -hmm. towing the party line, the government that you were representing. Both of you, I know, took that this uh, election process uh, seriously. You didn't take it for granted. I know that you were pounding the pavement. Were either of you surprised at this or did you have a legitimate sense that this so-called orange crush could knock you out of your writings i i it was i knew something was different and i knew something was different from the second week of the writ now i'd been door knocking since january and it was more or less what i expected but once the writ was dropped first week was as usual it's all oh is there an election is that municipal i really didn't get my roads plowed Mm -hmm. uh and then the second week it started uh to shift and it was different and i said that to the team but i couldn't quite put my finger on it and it was all the way through i've always had people saying well Lori or the nd So I've always had those conversations, but there was a lot more of them, and I was just a little unsettled. It didn't feel the same. I had a great team. We had so much fun on the doors and laughed and, you know, drank wine and ate potato chips afterwards, And but it was different. So I kind of knew. Uh, Probably in my subconscious I knew, because when it actually happened that night, I didn't, you know, fall over from shock. I went... Well, I won't say that on radio, uh, what I actually said. And uh, then I got up and did my goodbye speech. So, yeah, yeah, I felt it was different, but I didn't know why. Thomas, you had to know, of course, the party under whose banner you were running were in the crosshairs of many voters. But a lot of people thought that you might be safe in Edmonton Castle Downs because you were the only Tory MLA who went on record and said that the message at the doors is that Albertans want to see a corporate tax increase. You're also, uh, as if memory serves correct, the only 
PC MLA who stood up in support of gay-straight alliances essentially right off the bat. I could be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Did you think that you might survive an attack on the PC dynasty? You know, I, I, I did think I had a better chance of surviving, but I never thought that I definitely would. You know, the moment um, I saw the budget, and, and most Albertans will find it surprising, but uh, the entire PC caucus, including most ministers, never saw the budget until it was actually literally tabled in the House. The moment I saw the budget and the moment uh, I realized the Premier is going to call the election early, um, and, and the moment few other decisions were dropped by the Premier's office, uh, I knew we are going to have an issue. Um, and uh, and it became abundantly obvious. The floor crossing of Wild Rose to our party, uh, I knew that that will be an issue, uh, just intuitively. Because, But I had a, a bit of an unfair advantage because uh, I traveled in the leadership race. I put over 40,000 kilometers on my vehicles in, in three and a half months, and I listened to Albertans, and what I saw being presented to them was not what I heard from them. So there was a definite disconnect. But like Laurie, there are those moments uh, on a campaign where somebody says something that, that gives you a good, um, good feeling of what's going to happen. And, and I knocked on a young person's door, and this young gentleman opened the door, and he says, I am voting for MPD. And I said to him, what is that? He says, well, all my friends will be voting for MPD. You know, I chuckled, but the fact is that this young man was motivated by someone to vote, obviously, for NDP. He had no clue what it is, what he's voting for, uh, but that simply, this election was a trendy thing to do. We're seeing... That's what's... I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's what's killing me, is that what happened was what I'd been working for, was to get a better voter turnout, to uh, excite people about the issues, to step up and know that your vote matters, that it really counts, and specifically to get the 18 to 34-year-olds voting, because if you don't get them voting, they won't, they won't ever vote. And we knew that from a lot of studies that had been done. So this is what I was... This is what I wanted and it killed me I so it's a I guess that's called irony huh I was just gonna say Lori it's it's one of the cruelest if not the cruelest irony of the election results on Tuesday and I'll go on the record and say that you can't deny democracy and we must deal with whatever happens that said though so many of the things that I know you argued for you will now not have an opportunity to see come to fruition, to become a reality of the Alberta legislature. Enabling uh, and mobilizing the youth vote is one. Encouraging more women to enter politics, I know, is another. And, it, and I hope you'll accept me saying that it's a real shame that you won't be there to see that happen. Well, you know, I feel the same. <laughs> it's a real shame. I think I I could have brought some institutional memory as well, because boy, they're sh they're short on that. Um, but yeah, it just sometimes sometimes life sucks, and so life sucks, and I got to move on. You know, that's what democracy is about. The people spoke. I really respect and love my constituents. That's what they wanted. I got to take it and move on. We're seeing evidence right now of how beloved both of you are to your constituents. Our text line is lighting up at 6.30, 6.30. Our Twitter accounts as well. And I'll try to infuse some of these comments into our conversation. You both know Donovan Workin. Oh, yeah. uh, he tweets under at Atomic Improv, yeah, an Edmonton-based yeah. actor and comedian. He says, uh, Lori Blakeman and Thomas Lukasik may have lost their seats, but they didn't lose the respect of Albertans, unlike Jim Prentice. What does that mean to you, Thomas? Well, you know, I, I have some very strong feelings, obviously, about Jim. Um, uh, what really solidified those feelings is, is his choice of departure. Um, mm. You know, we, we have caucuses, and, and we go through good times and bad times, and I'm sure Laurie would have had those moments in caucus as well, where we disagree with our caucuses, and a variety of things happen. But at the end of the day, um, you are a team. And uh, when you're a leader of a party, you're, you're a captain of a ship. And um, to use a, a military analogy, you just don't leave your soldiers behind an enemy line and, and just walk away from it. Um, and I think um, that perhaps summed up the fact that uh, the voters were right. Um, many of them had intuitive feelings about him. They really didn't know why, um, but, but they were right. And that's why I also, much like Laurie, uh, I respect uh, the voters' choice in Castle Downs. And now I'm in a very peculiar position because a lot of the things that I have been working on behind the scenes, and even at times in collaboration uh, with Lori on some issues, uh, have come to fruition, and that's great. That's really good. 
But at the end of the day, I, I still believe that there is a room uh, for a centrist party, for a party that, um, that is socially progressive, uh, embraces many of those things that this fellow who wanted to vote for MPD uh, <laughs> voted for, and, and yet has a, a fiscally conservative uh, tone to it. And it, and it shows that, frankly, the, the party system doesn't really work because you have to pick sides. And, you know, half of the time uh, when Laurie would speak in a house, I would just shake my head and say, no, Laurie, I can't agree with that. But the other half of the time, I would agree with everything she says. And yet we were polarized. We had to sit in two separate camps and, um, and, and play against each other. I'm hoping that this is a beginning of a metamorphosis in our politics where, where we don't have to pick those rigid lines. And maybe the way to do it actually is to have not an ultra right wing party like we have right now or an ultra left wing party like we have right now, but maybe there is a room right in the middle for many of us to play together and actually work for a better Alberta. I'm glad that Kelsey Wynn Garrickson here filming all of this, and we'll make this video available at 630chad.com and, and, and on YouTube as well, because, Lori, your facial expressions are, are telling a story within themselves. Your response to what Thomas has just said. Well, um, I sort of agree, but not much, because I found... Here uh, we go again. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> well, I really found that the more that I work collaboratively with the people in the house... Uh, the further I got stuff to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I just said this, the issue transcends the party boundaries, uh, and I pursued it that way, it it did seem to work out really well. And you do hit a line where people just have to vote with their party, and, and I think that's the one that Thomas is talking about, being unable to break through. But for me, I worked a lot. I mean, we were at a point where Rachel and I sat down and designed a strategy to stop Bills 9 and 10, which were the two union bills. Mm -hmm. We had it written out. We had people assigned for what shifts they were going to do and what amendments we were going to do when, and we were ready to go. And we won. You know, they backed off. They let it go to committees where... In committees, that's where bills go to die in the summer in a stuffy room with no windows, and that's what happened. So we worked on that kind of collaborative level, and I and I think it can be done, but you're going to piss off your own party. And that's where the collaboration stopped, right? Because for as much talk as there's been about the Alberta Liberals combining forces with the Alberta Party, some have floated conceptually the idea of everyone center, center left and left getting together, even the NDP and the Alberta Liberals uh, cooperating. But as far as I've been concerned, or as far as I can glean from what I've heard, there's been no appetite for that, especially on the part of the NDs. Is that accurate, Lori? Yeah, that's true. Um, to give the NDs credit, it. Here's another irony. Uh, they really, really tried very hard to get me to cross to them, uh, either before the election, particularly before the election, to run as an ND. They really tried hard. There was much wine consumed, many, much wine. <laughs> if you cross the floor hammered, do you get a 24-hour rescind period? <laughs> yeah, well. Probably. Why didn't you? I just couldn't. It just... I'm not an ND. I am a liberal, and there was an ideology there that I I couldn't it was too narrow for me. Um, I'm very pragmatic. That's why I'm a liberal because I'm very pragmatic. I went there to get stuff done, not to abide by anybody's particular philosophy, um, and that's what always drove me forward. And I I realized at one point I was almost there, and I realized at one point that. If you're going to do that, then you have to become an ND. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, go and deliver their speeches. You have to raise money for them. Um, you have to believe what they believe. And I just wasn't that. I can work with them. I love them. My relatives are members. My friends are members. But I am. I just wasn't. And uh, I would happily collaborate, but I. I just, I just wasn't, and um, that's what happened. So I'm sure now they're saying, "Well, honey, you made your bed; you just lie in it," which is what I'm having to do. Thomas, what does your bed look like right now? <laughs> I mean, not literally. <laughs> Come over; I'll show you. Um, you know, uh, winding down from the campaign, obviously, uh, still a lot of work uh, to to reconcile finances and everything. But that will just take a few days. And then I'm going to have to sit back and think. You know, if, if uh, Mrs. Lukasik has it her way, 
uh, I would never enter politics again. Uh, you know, she she asked me weekly, "You, why are you doing this?" You know, there is a, a more graceful, easier, um, uh, less uh, masochistic way of earning a living uh, than being in politics, and and she's right. But you know what? Politics, as I said earlier, is is not a job; it's a passion. Uh, it's uh, it's a calling of sorts. So. I think we're going to have a lot of lengthy discussions over the next uh, few months uh, what my role will be in a, in a political world, uh, uh, and I'll have to make that decision. But uh, I'll take a couple of months, uh, spend some time with kids. You know, m my older one, she's 15 now. Um, she was one year old when I got first elected. Mm, I, I literally, that. yeah, yeah, I literally miss missed her growing up. So, catch up time. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, I, I am trying to interrupt because I think that for what I'm going to call successful politicians, they come into politics to do something, to drive an agenda, to accomplish something. And then there seems to be another group that want to be a politician. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that we all come to loathe, actually. They give us a bad name. They take advantage of expenses and push it to the limit. Um, they don't do the work. They don't do the research. Uh, you know, they don't hold office hours. They don't look after their constituents. But they do get to go to the parties and, you know, get introduced first and all of that kind sure. of thing. So I think that's where, because I do make a real difference between people who are there to do something and people who want to be politicians. When we come back, more with Thomas Lukasik and Lori Blakeman. We have a ton of ground to cover. I want to ask you if you'd invest in Alberta's oil and gas. You know Kevin O'Leary wouldn't. <laughs> I'm curious for your speculation on what Rachel Notley's cabinet might look like, what the government looks like moving forward. Thomas, some folks want to know if you'd consider running for the Alberta party. Lori, there's a suggestion from William Muncie, who I know you know. He wants to know if you'll seek the leadership of the Alberta Liberals. More with these two right after this. We're hanging out with uh, Lori Blakeman and Thomas Lukasik, just to let you two know, in the interest of fairness, your mics are now live again. Okay. <laughs> Lori, Lori, as of when? <laughs> as of right this minute. Uh, Lori, we went to break. You, you mentioned a story involving Donovan Workin, who had just sent a kind uh, tweet your way a few minutes ago. Yes, I just, you know, when I, I brought the Irrelevant, the cast of the Irrelevant show into the assembly to introduce them, because I was just so proud of the work they were doing, and they're all local local uh, artists and Donovan bless his heart brought his two kids in and was cool. so excited that his kids were going to be able to see the legislature and we took pictures on the steps but before the big doors and he had his children come and talk to me about being an MLA and I thought well who who would know it right this the, he has a certain professional image and yet here's this guy that brought his kids to the ledge when he was being introduced and had them have a little tour really nice in the second half of this hour I'll ask both of you to take a look back and we'll reminisce about some of your highlights uh, as MLAs. Right now, I think it's safe to say both of you uh, have served with parties that currently find themselves in trouble. And the political landscape in the legislature will be very interesting. I know that everyone hates when I use this phraseology, but it's essentially far left uh, in government and far right in opposition. Your two centrist parties, where do they go from here? Well, I, I, I think we'll have to do a lot of uh, soul searching within our own individual parties. You keep together. saying our. Well, our, I refer to PC and liberals within their own, I imagine. But the fact is, the legislature has never been as polarized, if, if, if there is such thing as right and left, as it is right now. You know, your, your opposition uh, is, is definitely as far right as, as, as you can get right now, and NDP obviously very far to the left. And, and the Liberal and, and PC caucus is, is virtually neg negligible right now. So uh, there is a big gap in between. Uh, what I will be suggesting to, to our party uh, shortly is that we go through what I call mea culpa process. We, we have to be very honest. We have to make sure that truth trumps over loyalty. We have to fess up to all the mistakes. <laughs> it's uh, like political AA. It will be exactly <laughs> a political AA. And, uh, and there will be some individuals whom we will have to say goodbye to forever um, uh, who have been institutional in the party. Um, and then we'll take it from there and, and see how whom can we work with, uh, who could potentially be the new members of the party so that we can fill that gap and actually present a real choice to constituents. You know, you don't have to go extreme right or extreme left. Uh, you can have a pragmatic party uh, in the legislature that deals with, with, with issues as they arise. 
You know, my theory in politics always has been that ideology is for when brains run out. You know, if you run a political party purely based on ideology, you end up making a lot of stupid decisions. Uh, to go out and say, I will never raise taxes, as the leader of Wild Rose kept saying, is, is, is foolhardy because there are times when you actually either want to or need to raise taxes. Uh, on social issues, you have to be reflective of, of what, what, what the mores of, uh, in, in the society are. So I think it's time for, for a pragmatic party in this province that can satisfy both ends of the spectrum. Oh boy, I'm hmm, I'm struggling on this, and uh, there'll be a lot of liberals out there that won't be happy to hear me say this. But um, I I still feel that I'm a liberal. I know what I'm about, um, but I think there my party seems to have left me, uh, and that happened a long time ago. Uh, people couldn't understand why I wasn't the leader or the interim leader coming into the election, but really the board of directors did not want me to start moving ahead on any kind of collaborative uh action at all. You sure made a statement, though, securing the nomination for the Alberta Party in your riding along with the Liberals and the Greens. Yep, because I was trying to do exactly what the NDs ended up doing. I was trying to get people excited. I was trying to give them hope that something, that it was possible to have change and was possible to work in a different way. So that optimism, that huge wave, that crush that everybody had, that's what I was trying to do by getting those three parties together. So I honestly don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure that the Liberals really want me around because they may see it as me causing some of their problems. I don't know what to do because they didn't, I don't know what to do. Okay, but hey, and damn it, we've run up against the clock. We got to get to the news. We'll pick this up when we come back because who's going to be the one that mobilizes, that excites, that inspires the Alberta Liberals moving forward. I've got all the respect in the world for Dr. David Swan, but it's a snooze fest. I'm not trying to be mean. That's just the facts. Is that party in risk? Is it at risk of absolutely imploding, of disappearing off the landscape? And what happens to the PCs? And what does the NDP cabinet look like? More with Thomas Lukasik and Lori Blakeman right after this. Hanging out in this Friday morning round table with uh, two long-time and very popular Edmonton MLAs. Thomas Lukasik, a long-time Tory, one-time Deputy Premier, and Lori Blakeman, described as the most effective opposition MLA in Alberta's history when an amended Bill 10 passed. How did that make you feel? Because for a long time, you were essentially, with apologies to your colleagues in the Liberal caucus, I don't mean any disrespect, that you were a bit of a lone wolf in a Tory-dominated legislature. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get used to that. I mean, it's not fun, but you, you do get used to it. But uh, the morning I came in, I on that Tuesday, I thought, you know, that's weird. They don't have very much government business on today. I wonder if they're going to pull a fast one and put Bill 10 up again. So I actually took everything I had with me into the house because I thought something might happen. And indeed it did. Uh, and I knew about it a little bit in advance, but not by much. Like I'm thinking it was about... 25 minutes uh, and it all started to unroll and it's just like I don't know how to describe it it's just like watching everything you've ever worked for open up like a flower and all mm. the possibilities of the world just come floating out like little sparkles it, I just can't describe what it's like to know the change in people's lives that was gonna happen in Alberta because I was just a stubborn bitch <laughs> It was like your opus. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And I just was not letting go of it because, bottom line, this was about keeping kids safe. Bottom line, this was about understanding that everybody should be uh, welcomed and have peer support and be safe. Uh, and I just kept going back to that and going, you cannot tell me a reason why th it's appropriate to not do this. Was the groundwork that your original private member's Bill 202 laid for the passage of the ultimately amended Bill 10 your greatest career accomplishment of the legislature? Oh, boy. Oh, yes, I think for long-term change in public policy in Alberta, yes. Um, 
I did a lot of other small things, um, some of it in the legislature, some of it outside. I worked with a colleague, um, a constituent for a long time to get the diagnostic billing codes Mm -hmm. in Alberta changed because they could continue to bill um, homosexuality as uh, a mental illness because they were using an old reference and it was really hard. I had to keep going back over and over again as the government kept saying, yeah, we've dealt with that, but then they hadn't and it was still on the website and it was still the number was still used and the caption was still used and I just had to go back over and over again and sort of embarrass them into finally changing the whole thing so there was little things I did like that plus things I'm really proud of like um, getting an elevator for Kiwanis seniors residents because all of the programs that existed none of them allowed them to get money from the government to build an elevator and this was a huge problem uh and i had very public fights with the minister of seniors about getting this elevator and all of a sudden it only took me five months and then there was money for an elevator thomas when you look back on your career at the legislature is is there one accomplishment or one thing you were a part of that you would characterize as the highlight of your 14-year career Part to think of one, Bill 10 obviously was a big one. Um, it took a lot of work and and um, and a lot of grief. What, may I ask, may I interrupt and ask what the biggest challenges were behind the scenes on the Tory side of Bill 10? Well, it, it, was, a, it was a bill, again, uh, drafted by the Premier's office and, and caucus had no input. If, if, CAC, if caucus had input, uh, the bill would have looked like differently because there were many caucus members that behind the scene did not approve the bill. Um, and knew but, better. And knew better. And, and knew and, what and, to do. And and are very good, hardworking, um, or were hardworking MLAs. Uh, but it, it took a lot to to say to the entire caucus, sorry guys, I'm parting ways, and then vote against my own caucus in the House on a bill that, that was Premier's flagship bill on human rights. Um, so, so that was one. Uh, you know, um, uh, you'll read about it maybe one day, but uh, the monumental fight that I had with Premier Redford when I found out just a glimpse of what was going on and getting fired the next day and put in the basement, you know, that that was surreal. Uh, because when you walk into a Premier's office, you know, it, it doesn't matter who the Premier is, it's that Premier's office. And when you get into a shouting ma- match with the Premier and and colorful language starts flying in both directions, um, it, it, was, it was something that I'll never forget in my life. But you know, it's the little things, and I'll never forget this one. Uh, this grandma walks into my constituency office with a little baby. Uh, the little baby's mom is no longer around, and they're on social assistance, and the girl is showing, uh, showing uh, skills in music, and she says, I would love to get her a piano, but I can't afford it. Obviously, government will not buy a child a piano. I said, well, let's figure out what we can do, and we got a few charities going. And we got her a piano, so that was, I still tear up, that was uh, 10 years ago. And just recently I got a letter from a U of A fine arts student saying, I'm in music now because of that piano. Yeah, it is. Sometimes you can work, because you know people, you can connect people that are outside of politics to make those kinds of things happen. And they, you don't get to talk about them and you don't, you certainly don't boast about them but they're very precious moments when you can make all of those connections come in and you either get somebody uh, you know better health or a place to live or a piano or um, it's just it's the strangest little things it's it's what people normally don't see because that's that's the 80 percent of work that MLAs do in the constituency office working on individual files and you know people go to an MLA when they're at the end of the rope usually, yeah. when when the system has failed and they have nowhere else to go, they come to your office and you feel like you're managing 50, 60 families' lives. You know, you stick handle their everyday issues and some become frequent flyers. They're in your office every three days. Um, and at the end of the day, when you get that thank you note, that's all you really need. When we come back, I want to ask you if 20 or 24-year-old MLAs can adequately do the job that's going to be demanded of them in just a short time. More with Thomas Lukasik and Lori Blakeman after this. I've got a listener uh, here, Jesus, 
Says Lukasik was my MLA in Castle Downs. Then I moved to, is it Clarvatten? Clarvatten? Clarvatten, yes. Clarvatten. He says, when he rang my doorbell and I saw him, I was already on board with him. I even insisted he put a sign on my lawn. What a good guy. We need more politicians like him. By the way, Thomas, my daughter, say hello and that you're a nice man and they're just two and four years of age. Hey, girls. <laughs> Both of you uh, sharing stories through the commercial break off air about some of your uh, favorite memories dealing with constituents. There are 49 or uh, inexperienced NDP MLAs that are just starting right now to figure out what the job entails. Some of them 20, 24, 25 years of age. Some of them being criticized for having photos on their social media accounts that may not reflect the decorum expected of an MLA. What are these new NDP MLAs in store for? Well, uh, First of all, they're in shock and awe, shock and awe <laughs> uh, massive learning curve, uh, not only of issues, because when constituents come to your office, they expect you to be helpful, uh, but parliamentary procedures, which are have nothing to do with logic. It's just purely tradition, but you have to know them. Um, Yes, they do. If you know those rules, they will open the doors to everything. That's that, why I loved it. But... Uh, it well okay. It may not always make sense to outsiders why we do things in a certain order, but no, the rules are what makes it all spin. And if you know how it works, you can make it work for you. It's oh, huge! Very learning curve. unique rules that you don't use anywhere else. Uh, but uh, but uh, life fix. You know what I found. All of us start as rookies. You know everybody has a day one as an MLA. What I personally found helpful was was my life history. Uh, you know, uh, my par my mom, single mom, was on social assistance and she couldn't speak English, so I was actually navigating it for her as a teenager. Um, the immigration process, becoming a teacher uh, and teaching a little and then running my own business uh, and serving a number of committees uh, prior to government, all that put together gave me uh, at least a good start. And, and then, you know, uh, I turned this into a lifestyle, and, and, I, and I still call myself a student of politics. I, every day I went to legislature, to my constituency office, I learned something. So I, I wish them all the best, uh, because I'm, I'm sort of torn, because I, I honestly want Premier Notley to do well. Because this is my province, I love this province, my kids will be growing up in this province, and, and I don't want my government to be making any wrong decisions. And then I wanted to crash and burn in four years uh, at the election time. So I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, she, she definitely would, would get all the support and advice that I could give because I do want them to make right decisions. Lori, do you have faith that Albertans can be in good hands under an NDP government? Oh, yes. Um yeah, no, I think they'll be they'll they'll be fine. Uh, the team that she started with, that she went into the election with, are very good, hardworking MLAs who had their feet under them. I mean, Darren Billis had only been there uh, three years, but he worked really hard, and and he was he'd sort of gotten he understood where he was and how to work inside. I mean, Don Massey, who was um, elected and sat next to me in the house, had five bruises on his arm for about a year and a half because I kept reaching over and grabbing his arm and going. What's happening? What's happening? And it is a complete blur because all of this stuff just goes on before your eyes and you have no idea why or if you're supposed to do something or if you're next. It's absolutely terrifying. And and Thomas is right. I mean, I got in there thinking, oh, my God, what do I know? And yet, as each issue came up, I thought, oh, actually, I worked on that one when, on, uh, when I was with the Advisory Council on Women's Issues. Oh, yeah, that one I did when I was running Theatre Network. Oh, hang on, I know about that from... So, actually, I did great when I got in there on the issues because I had a lot of life experience that I was bringing in with me that helped me. The Premier is going to have to put a cabinet together. And some of them might be obvious. It's been suggested that potentially Sarah Hoffman, former chair of the Edmonton Public School Board, takes the Ministry of Education. Dr. Bob Turner probably gets the Ministry of Health, with apologies to David Egan. Brian Mason, obviously an experienced and tenured MLA, will no doubt receive a ministry. But there's the Ministry of Finance. There's the Ministry of Agriculture. There's the Ministry of Energy. Do you see shortcomings here? Well, you know, Brian, I, I consider him a friend. And uh, it's been no secret that Brian and I would go out for a glass of wine uh, every so often and just park politics outside of the establishment and just talk about this and that. We're, and he's in wine again. I'm just raising that. That's right. Yeah, yeah be careful. <laughs> be, watch their expenditures on wine. That's the, We're going to have to foip that. Yeah. But, um, but the fact is that Brian has a lot of life experience. He has a lot of parliamentary experience. He has city hall experience. And I think he, he will make a fine minister. 
Um, others, well, again, uh, for some time, I imagine the government will be run by deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers who will be putting forward policies, and um, and and the government for a while will not have the insight uh, to see through it, and um, that's always a danger because you know bureaucracy uh, is a, is a beast in itself. It has its own life and its own agenda. And, and I always found as a cabinet minister in a variety of my portfolios that they, they would try to lead you towards conclusions and then finally once you figure out the portfolio you would assume the control of that portfolio and I tell you there would always be a whole bunch of unhappy bureaucrats in the system because they knew what questions to ask and where the problems were. Is yep. partisanship with existing deputy ministers a concern? Could this be a storyline moving forward? Oh my god For I sure. cannot imagine and I sort of thought of it in you know moments of positive daydreaming and points in my life going well gee if the Liberals won how would we do this? Do you leave the deputy ministers in place that are, you know, almost everyone in the upper levels of management and government are partisan. It's highly politicized, although it's not supposed to be. Um, do you leave them there uh, and they're going to run on a slightly different agenda? And remembering that what works for the bureaucrats may not be good policy for right. the people right. because bureaucrats want to treat everybody the same and they'd like you all lined up and neat, please. And that's just not the way the world actually works. So do you leave those deputy ministers in place? knowing they may have a different agenda or do you dump them all and bring in what people from Ontario that worked for the NDs there are you kidding me Whoa, no I'm not kidding you, you. know uh, the amount of text messages we've received about Bob Ray I can tell you that if they brought anybody from an NDP regime in Ontario to Alberta they'd probably have to answer to a mob well, at the legislature to, so a, to Premier Romano ex-Premier Romano and, and that is look, that seems to me to be political suicide days after drop, an election they have to drop a budget within the next month that's a 42 need help. billion with a b billion dollar budget and you're going to have 50 some people who possibly may never have seen a budget in their life particularly not of this magnitude um, it will be at the beginning deputy ministers uh, drafting the budget and and sure they will put some final touches on it and add a little bit of an NDP flavor to it but it'll take time as a, as I said before I, I hope they're they are quick learners because I do want them to be successful as government when we come back with Thomas Lukasik and Lori Blakeman, I'm going to ask them if either of them will invest a portion of their transition allowance in oil and gas, because we know <laughs> Kevin O'Leary's not. More with these two right after this. One minute left. Can you believe it? This hour has flown by with Thomas Lukasik and Lori Blakeman. Maggie says, great roundtable today. If your two guests honestly believe Alberta will be okay with the NDP, then so do I. Thank you, Lori and Thomas. And Will Muncy, past president of the Alberta Party, says, damn it, I had so much farm work to do, and here I sit listening to the radio drinking tea it's been great thank you to both of you <laughs> well let's do it again kevin o'leary the loudmouth billionaire says he wouldn't invest in alberta the two of you will be coming into transition allowances would you plug any of them into oil and gas stocks right yeah, now I don't listen to kevin this is a great province invest in alberta irrelevant of government sure absolutely why would well mind you he's from outside of alberta there you go uh no no they'll they'll do fine and our money's fine everybody should just take a pill chill out exactly. be supportive and move on. Lori, federal politics, there's an election this fall, yes or no? No. Thomas? Probably not. Mrs. Lukasik would kill me. There's an opening in your riding. I know I'm hearing about it, but you know what? I, I don't get to make decisions at home. I got to make decisions at the legislature, but never at home. Oh, run liberal. There's a liberal opening. I'm hearing. <laughs> Thank you, too, for your years of service at the Alberta Legislature, for the tireless, motivated work that you did, and for the countless lives that you impacted. Thomas Lukasik, Lori Blakeman, thank you for being here with us today. It was thank our you. pleasure. Awesome. If you know anyone that would love to hear this interview in its entirety, we'll post the SoundCloud file at 630ched.com. We're back at it Monday. If you didn't hear your email read today, don't sweat it. Monday morning, we open up the mailbag. Have a great weekend, everyone. And we'll talk to you Monday morning at 9 a.m.